Hello guys, to talk about the female reproductive system. So, the basic parts are of course the ovary, there's the uterine tube, the uterus, the cervix, which is part of the uterus, and lastly the vagina. So, let's start talking about the ovaries, the, the one of the most basic units of the female reproductive system. So, the ovary, the function of the ovaries is of course to form the oocyte. Uh, the whole procedure starts with the yolk sulk primordial cells that will eventually migrate and start to uh, form the oogonia. The oogonia will automatically divide and reach uh, 600,000 within the end of the second month in the embryon embryonic development. By the end of the fifth, they're going to reach the 7 million. Uh, of course, this number is not unfortunately available in the adult life because they're gonna, after they will differentiate into the primary oocytes, they're gonna st most of them are going to start to undergo atresia. Atresia is the process of loss of the regression of most of these primary oocytes. And only 550 of them are actually available throughout the whole female uh, adult life. So. Uh, let's start talking about the, between the parallelism between the oocyte and the follicle. What is the follicle? The follicle is a structure within the ovaries that bears, that actually brings the oocytes themselves. Now we're going to start seeing the different uh, de uh, developmental levels, let's call them, different developmental ste steps of these oocytes. First up, we're going to have the primordial follicle. Then it's going to differentiate and it's going to progress to the primary follicle. Then the secondary, then the vesicular, and then we're going to have corpus luteum, and in the end, after the regression of the corpus luteum, we're going to have the corpus albicans. Now, we'll, of course, we'll discuss them in detail in just shortly in a bit. So, let's talk about the three different cells populations that we're going to find within the ovarian follicle. Now, typically, the ovarian follicles will be found in the, along, along the cortex of the ovary. The outer part of the ovary is going to be covered with a germinal epithelium, again, the tunica albuginea, similar, of course, to the testis. But in this case, this, the, this covering part is going to be uh, the cuboidal germinal epithelium. Now, we're going to find, I told you, three populations. The oocyte, the follicular cells, and the stromal cells. We're going to talk shortly about, the, uh, let's say, the future of these cells. The oocyte eventually uh, is going to start to grow in size, is going to start to have a more prominent RER, a more prominent, of course, uh, Golgi apparatus, and it's going to start to produce uh, specific glycoproteins that will form eventually the zona pellucida. This is a very important feature. We'll discuss this in the acrosome in just a bit. A zona pellucida is nothing more than just a layer that is filled with glycoproteins that play a role into the fertilization of the uh, oocyte. Now, <clears throat> the second one we're going to talk about is the follicular cell. The follicular cell is the next cell from the innermost to the outermost part, the middle part, let's call it, that will eventually start to multiply to start forming a stratified structure and form the granulosa cells. So the granulosa cells are, in fact, just multiplied follicular cells. Uh, exactly in the outermost layer, we're going to find the stromal cells that will eventually start to, of course, proliferate and form two different layers, the theca interna and theca externa. Theca means, in fact, covering uh, the outer cover of a specific location, specific structure. In this case, we're going to have the external layer and the internal layer of this theca. So uh, let's actually see them just a bit microscopically and then discuss exactly their functions. So this is a typical example of the primordial follicle. We're going to have this, the central part, the primary oocyte, surrounded by the follicular cells. Uh, exactly in the next step, we're going to have the primary follicle. Now the primary follicle is going to be either unilamellar or, un or multilamellar. Of course, this means that we're going to have one or more layers. Uh, the point, of course, being that, again, we're going to have the primary oocyte in the center. Again, we're going to have the follicular cells either in one layer or multiple layers. And in we're going to find the, uh, the stromal cell again. Uh, in this case, we're going to be start to form the uh, start to form the theca. Now, the first term that we're going to see that the theca is going to be in the secondary or antral follicle. Uh, there actually, it's a very important not, uh, feature to remember both names because they can be used interchangeably throughout literature and throughout tests and generally throughout the uh, your medical career. So, uh, of course, these theca internal cells are going to start forming in the typically in the end of the multilaminar primary follicle, and they're going to be easily and clearly visible in the, uh, much more clearly visible in the uh, secondary or antral follicle. Then the antral follicle are going to start forming the both, the theca interna and the externa. And lastly, the last phase is going to be the mature preovulatory or graphian follicle. Graphian from the name of uh, the person that discovered them, of course, is going to be uh, Renier de Graff. Uh, what's important also to notice is this term antrum. Antrum is the space between the, uh, granulo the granulosa cells and the cells, the granulosa cells that actually bear and bring the, uh, in fact, the oocyte. Antrum literally means cave. So this empty space is going to be called the cave, the antrum 
uh, in this specific location. So let's talk about the function of these cells. So we're going to have the granulosa cells in the beginning. Of course, we're going to these, uh, the first form of these cells will be the follicular cells that will eventually multiply and differentiate to form the granulosa cells. Now, there are going to be a lot of functions, and I know this can be a bit complex and confusing, but the moment we complete the circle and the explanation, all of these pieces are going to fit perfectly together as in a puzzle. So uh, do not lose your, not lose your courage and just keep up. So the granulosa cells contain, pr produce, and secrete this follicular fluid. The follicular fluid, of course, is uh, deposited within the empty spaces of the antrum. Now, these follicular, this follicular fluid is going to contain, uh, is, is going to contain, of course, plasminogen. Plasminogen is a molecule that actually helps cleave uh, collagen. This is important. The granulosa cell itself is going to have aromatase. Aromatase is an enzyme that cleaves and, uh, in fact, <clears throat> catalyzes the conversion of the pre of the precursor of the estradiol. Estradiol is an estrogen. So the granulosa cell is going to contain the enzyme that will actually uh, convert the precursor of estradiol to estradiol, a form of the estrogen. This is important to remember. Uh, of course, the granulosa cells, the fluid, the follicular fluid is going to contain also prostaglandins. Now, typically, these prostaglandins that can be deposited within this uh, fluid are going to be towards the smooth muscle contraction. And then we're going to start noticing other sort of secretions, such as steroids, which are going to be, of course, used as in, in the form of progesterone in the androstenedion. This is, of course, the precursor molecule of the estradiol, this one right here. And lastly, the estrogen, which is, of course, the final version of the... Uh, what this estrogen is going to be the final version of the, uh, let's say, the, <clears throat> the precursor molecules that we discussed before. Now, along with this, uh, with this contrast, we're going to find also hyaluronic acid, growth factors, fibrinogen, and heparin sulfate. Now, the, and just imagine and just bear in mind this for 100% that you need to remember is that at least the three first uh, contents that can be found in this follicular fluid, and of course that the, is a function of the, of the granulosa cell, the aromatase, the enzyme that cleaves and, and uh, converts to the estradiol, plasminogen that cleaves and destroys collagen, and the prostaglandins that induce smooth muscle contraction. Why do we even care? We'll just see in a bit. Stromal cells, the ones that, of course, are the end result, the end result of the, uh, the stromal cells will eventually, of course, form the theca interna and externa. And so the theca interna has one function, one of the many functions, of course, is to secrete the precursor of estradiol, the androstenedion. This is the molecule we talked before. So, in fact, the stromal cell will produce this, uh, this exact, the precursor and is going to depose, give it, is going to pass it on to the uh, granuloma, the granulomatosa cells and they will, in fact, converted to estradiol. Estradiol in the end is going to be uh, deposited within the bloodstream and we're going to see exactly what's going to happen. There is a very close uh, relationship between estradiol and the FSH. FSH is the follicular stimulating hormone. So the point is that estradiol in fact inhibits the uh, secretion, the release of FSH in some specific phases. We'll discuss it in just a bit. Uh, in fact, in the the continual uh, the continuous pr uh, progression the continuous production of estradiol is going to keep the estrogen levels in a specific in a specific manner and the whole structure the whole architecture of both the granulomatosa and the stromal cell is to keep producing estrogen until of course the estrogen peaks and we're going to have the event of the LH uh, the LH the luteinizing hormone uh, release we'll see that this actually initiates the ovulation. So the whole point of the stromal cells and granulomatous cells is to reach the estrogen, to maintain the estrogen in a specific level, to start in, to, in, to induce, to, in, to inhibit specifically the FSH to the point of a low, of a low uh, levels and low, of course, doses, to lead and to actually allow for the LH to do this peak and initiate the ovulation. So this is exactly the balance and the point of these interaction between these two, uh, these two cells, these populations of cells. So, uh, in other words, the FSH actually plays this role that we just discussed, and, and also, furthermore, it induces the, pro the uh, production of this estrogen precursor, the androstenedion. Uh, the theca externa contains fibroblasts and smooth muscles, this is important, and this is where actually we fit with the prostaglandins. If you remember, I just told you that prostaglandins, in fact, in these ones, in a specific location, they induce the smooth muscle contraction. So this is exactly where they work. We're going to see exactly when all of these features perfectly bind together to exert and to actually uh, facilitate and assist 
the whole ovulatory procedure. Now the graphic is going to be specifically, we're going to have the primordial follicles again. Typically speaking, you should find the more, uh, let's say, the less developed uh, follicles, the primary forms and the primordial, of course, towards the cortex, towards the more outer part of the, uh, of the ovary. First, you're going to find the primordial, then we're going to have exactly the next, the primary, which will be subdivided into, into unilamellar and multilamellar. Then the furthermore maturation is going to bring the secondary follicle. Uh, the difference between the primary and the secondary is the presence of this exact granulosa cells that bear uh, the that exactly bear the whole oocyte. This is going to be called cumulus oophorus, and exactly the next stage is going to be the vesicular uh, uh, follicle, which is actually going to bring is going to have a much bigger antrum, a much bigger space between these between this area, and lastly, that's going to be before the ovulation. Actually, the end of the ovulation is going to be the uh, the emptying and of course the releasing of the whole zona pellucida, corona radiata. Again, corona radiata is of course the granulosa cells that are actually attached on this uh, on the oocyte. And remain, we're going to maintain and keep two structures here, both the theca interna and externa, and of course the granulosa cells that are in the remnants in the walls of the antrum. So uh, exactly after ovulation, we're going to have the formation of the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is in fact a temporary entro, uh, endocrine organ. We'll see just a bit what happens with this organ. Now, if we're going to have a uh, specific the fertilization, we're going to, this corpus luteum is going to keep on growing and growing. And because of the specific function of the, of the uh, embryo and the specific, the, the, the zygote actually, we're going to have the maintenance of the corpus luteum. If in case there is no, there's no presence of fertilization, the corpus luteum is going to fastly and quickly regress to the corpus albicans. Albicans means white. And this is because it's going to be nothing more than just scar tissue. This is going to be just dense connective uh, tissue, which eventually will regress and just be integrated with the stroma of the ovary. So let's talk about the corpus luteum just a bit more. Uh, so the point of the, I told you before that corpus luteum actually is the, the product of the cells that remain, of course, they're going to be the granulosa cells and the theca cells. Specifically, the granulosa cells are going to become granulosa lutein cells. Why? Well, because this is an, an event that takes place after the peak of the estrogen. Of course, it's going to be the, uh, the peak of the estrogen and it's going to induce the FSH lowest peak, the minimal amount of, est of FSH. And as a consequence, it's going to induce the uh, release of luteinizing hormone LH. And because we're going to have this exact peak, as we can see the graph right here, this is going to induce one of the functions. Of course, it's going to be induced the ovulation and maintain uh, the granulosa cells and the theca internal cells. Now, because of the function of the LH, these uh, granulosa cells will become granulosa lutein cells. And instead of the or instead of the previous role, this was mostly based on the uh, protein. This is going to actually change and it's going to expand the role into the aromatase conversion. Of course, we talk about the aromatase, the enzyme that converts pre-estradiol to estradiol. Uh, and uh, the next cell, of course, is going to be the theca internal, will be, which will become the theca lutein cell. And the uh, effect of LH on these cells to produce high amount of proge progesterone. And of course, as also as a lower amount, the, uh, again, the precursor of the estradiol, the androstenedion. The point here is that this, there's going to be two balances, as you saw so far, uh, when it comes to the hormonal regulation. One is that the estrogen inhibits the FSH release, and this is, and we see that uh, the initial FSH actually is going to induce the production of, uh, the, um, of, the, of the precursor right here. And of course, after some time, we're going to have the uh, conversion of the andro androstenedione to estradiol. And the estradiol, of course, which is an estrogen, will start to inhibit the FSH release and start to reduce and reduce and reduce until it reaches the maximal peak level when we're going to have, again, a, a peak of both FSH and most importantly, the LH that actually is going to uh, start to induce this uh, changes in the corpus luteum. I just told you that the theca internal will actually become theca lutein cells and produce progesterone. Progesterone, in fact, is a molecule, is a hormone that will maintain the uterine mucosa. We'll see exactly why we're going to do this in the point of the, when we actually start uh, studying and talking about the uh, uterus. So uh, to sum up, we're going to have a very, very intricate and very complex uh, endocrine system and food feedback and uh, functions and interactions. Uh, long story short, the first stage is going to be the 
the release of gonadotropic releasing hormone uh, from the hypothalamus. This in turn is going to induce FSH and LH uh, release from the adenohypophysis. FSH and LH will stimulate follicular development. Primarily FSH is going to be responsible for this. Because of the function of the FSH, we're going to have the secretion of the precursor molecule of estradiol. Now, in the, the next stage, the granulosa cell is going to actually, uh, con uh, of course, is going to actually convert to estradiol and then deposit it in the bloodstream. The function of estradiol is going to be to slowly, weakly uh, inhibit uh, the FSH production until it reaches the peak level. So when we have the maximal amount of estrogen in the blood, we're going to have the uh, induction of, uh, of the activation of hypothalamus to produce, uh, as a consequence, the LH. And the LH, in turn, is going to initiate the whole procedure of forming the corpus luteum. So during the time we're going to have the LH release and the LH, uh, of course, release in the bloodstream, we're going to start seeing these changes as, as, of course, a direct and indirect consequence of the LH function. So uh, we're going to have the increased amount of prostaglandins uh, in the granulosa cells. As a consequence, we're going to have induced uh, smooth muscle contractions. Why would we care? Well, because the theca externa actually contains smooth muscles. So if you actually contract the theca, the outer covering, you're going to help and assist the whole ovulatory procedure, the release of the oocyte along with the, of course, with the, with the granulosa cells into the uterine tube. Another one is going to, another event that's going to assist this release is going to be the in, in, induction of increase of production of the hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is a hydrophilic uh, molecule and actually will help uh, lubricate the movement uh, from the lumen towards the uterus. Now, uh, the point is what? That exactly between the oocyte, exactly between the, this, uh, the ovulatory content and the uterine, you're going to find, of course, the tunica albuginae, which in fact is, I told you, there are two things here, the germinal epithelium, of course, and always, of course, in most connective tissues, collagen. So in this case, the plasminogen that was again produced by the same granulosa cells will help and assist with three manners. First, we'll destroy the collagen and destroy the germinal epithelium so they can pass through, so that the, uh, the content of ovulation can pass through. The second is going to be to induce the smooth muscle contraction from the theca externa to assist again the same function. And one more, of course, will be that it brings the lubrication through the hyaluronic acid uh, in, this, in this system. So uh, let's, let's actually see this macrostructure under the microscope. So I told you before, we're going to, again, the capsule, of course, the outer part is going to have two different types of uh, cells. We're going to have the germinal epithelium and, as always, the dense electronic tissue that, is, that typically consists the albuginea, similar, of course, to the testes. So if we zoom in, we can actually see that these cells are more cuboidal looking cells right here. Okay. Exactly beneath it, we're going to start seeing the cortex. Now the cortex is going, we're going to start noticing the primordial, uh, the primordial uh, follicles. The difference in the primordial and the primary would be, of course, in the, in the shape and the form of the follicular uh, cells. The follicular cells in the primordial tend to be more flat, such as like this. In the primary, they're going to tend to be more cuboidal. Of course, there's going to be a uh, progression through this whole phase, so it's not that always. For example, this is a more cuboidal appearance of the, of the, uh, of the follicular cell. Now, this is the typical and very nice uh, step between the uh, unilateral, unilamellar, sorry, uh, follicle that contains one and the initiations of the formation of a multilamellar. So, in the end, we're going to start seeing the, uh, in the multilamellar, this is the unilamellar, the typical example right here. This is a clear, uh, clear, of course, one layer structure. Again, I think this is the typical form of this is the zona pellucida. This exact line is the zona pellucida. These are the follicular cells. And surrounding these small cells, these more flat like cells, are going to be the stromal cells. Uh, and uh, in the point of the multilamellar, we're going to see exactly the same feature with the difference of more layers and more stratified epithelium of the follicular cells. And again, this is a more distinct, uh, this is more, this area is more distinct and more easily, of course, we can see and identify the, uh, the theca, the theca in turn in this case. So if we zoom out, we're going to see the rest of the structures. So exactly, this is the, in fact, the uh, secondary, uh, the antral, of course, uh, follicle. And how do we know? Because we have the presence of this cumulus O4 right here, this presence, this granulosa cells, in fact, are here. This is the antrum. So again, this can be called the antral. 
And again, here we're going to find a much more clear uh, in circle en encapsulation of the thicker cells of the, uh, specifically the, the what used to be uh, the stromal cells. Now we're going to have two layers, the thicker interna and the thicker externa. As we can see, just by the presence of the uh, morphology, of course, of the cells, these cells, the inner, the thicker internal cells are more productive when it comes to the uh, steroid function. So this is a more, a more productive uh, phenotype. And this is the more, let's say, uh, fi fibrillar, which contains, again, fibro fibro fibroblasts and uh, smooth muscle cells. And lastly, we should see the biggest structure of them all. And it's, in fact, very, very easy to locate, always because it can be actually seen by even the smallest magnification. And this is going to be the last, the mature graphian follicle. Uh, most of these structures should have, of course, in the, on the periphery, the oocyte, but because of this, the size of the structure, because this, the structure tends to be very, very uh, thick and volumetrically big, uh, it's not that easy to find the section that will actually contain uh, the oocyte itself. So this is exactly the same features, again, discussed uh, in this uh, slide. This is a very easy way to uh, compare what you see with what you think it is. So this is the first very nice indication of what you have. Again, the model is going to have the very, very small, thin layer of the uh, granulosus of the uh, follicular cell, then we're going to have the cuboidal, then the stratified cuboidal, and then of course we're going to have the antral, we can actually uh, easily identify based on the presence of the cumulus oophorus and the size of course. And the difference between the secondary antral uh, with the mature is going to be that if you have the section that contains the exact um, or, or cumulus oophorus and exact oocyte is of course the size and the diameter of the whole antrum. Uh, next up, we talked about the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum, of course, is the structure that will actually produce uh, these molecules that we discussed in before. The point here is that uh, this is a very, very thick structure. This is, in fact, the temporary endocrine organ. And we're going to find two different cells, the granulosa lutein cells and the thicker lutein cells, where we discussed what they do. Uh, the point is how to actually visualize them in the microscope. As you can see, this is the over again, this different section. These are the corpus albicans. They're very easy to identify because we're going to have this typical eosinophilic color. And again, this is nothing more than just scar tissue. This is connective uh, tissue, uh, dense connective tissue. And by this, by looking at this very, very uh, big lumen that used to be empty, now this actually, in, in fact, uh, contains different contents, different, let's say, uh, components. In the periphery, we're going to start seeing again the two different populations, the granulosa and the theca. So what's the difference? How do we differentiate, morphologically speaking, these two cells? Well, based on their size, uh, because the granulosa lutein cells are going to be, in fact, very, very big cells. For example, this is a typical theca, uh, this is a very typical, sorry, this is a very typical granulosa uh, lutein cell. This is a very, very large cell. And these smaller cells that have a smaller amount of cytoplasm, these are going to be, in fact, the, uh, the theca lutein cells. Now, again, the, the function is that these thick lutein cells produce androgens, progesterone, and most importantly, progesterone, and a lower amount of the precursor of estradiol. And uh, the next one is going to be the lutein cell that, in fact, will produce, again, produce progesterone uh, and convert and convert them into the, and convert the precursor to the estrogen itself. One last thing we should mention in the, when it comes to the uh, specifically the ovaries is that the medulla is an area that continually contains connective tissue and vessels. There is no specific unique feature to it, nothing to be discussed about it. So the most important feature, of course, in the, of the ovary is going to be the cortex, where we find the different uh, follicles and the different, different evolutionary and developmental uh, levels. So let's move on.